Hello, and welcome to this video about effective assessment for OCR Cambridge Nationals. My name is Ros Kayax and I work for OCR. Hello, my name is Anne Kelsall. I'm the lead moderator for OCR Cambridge Nationals in ICT. This video is for teachers and assessors of Cambridge Nationals in ICT. We're going to give you some top tips to help you understand our moderation requirements and make the process as smooth as possible. As we go along, we'll give you some examples. If you've got more questions once you've watched this video, please join one of our moderation CPD events. They're all free and Anne will be there to answer your questions. We've divided this video into seven sections. Before you start delivery of the qualification, whilst learners are completing their assignment, assessing evidence, getting ready for moderation, submission of evidence, dealing with and reporting malpractice, and finally, further sources of help and advice. Anne, what advice would you give to a centre, especially one new to the qualification, before they start teaching content to their learners? Well, you need to make sure that you're really familiar with the content of each unit. This explains all the teaching content that learners will have needed to cover for the qualification. This should be the basis of your scheme of work, showing what you need to teach. The assessment criteria show you what learners need to be able to demonstrate as a result of the teaching and learning. You should also look at all the OCR set assignments for the units you plan to offer, as this will show you what learners must be able to do in their assessment. But remember, you must deliver all of your teaching before your learners start their assignment. It's good to do this using a range of different contexts to enable learners to apply their skills, knowledge and understanding to the tasks contained within the OCR assignment when the time comes. The assignments are designed to show what your learners have learnt. So in other words, we're talking about summative assessment. OK. Can I change parts of the assignment? As part of recent improvements, we've made it really clear if you can make changes to the assignments. Where you can, this only relates to the scenario, not to the tasks. OK. Can you give me an example of that? Yes. In Unit R007, learners need to create a dynamic product. This can be based on your local tourist attraction or a different context, but it must be a dynamic product. So I can't change anything other than the scenario? No. If you change any of the wording of the tasks, or break them down into smaller subtasks, you might inadvertently give the learners too much scaffolding, which can be seen as over-assistance. So it's important that all learners have exactly the same opportunity to demonstrate what they know, understand and can do, regardless of the centre they come from. OK, so just to sum up, unless the assignment explicitly states you can change the scenario, you shouldn't make any changes to the assignment itself. Absolutely. For the reasons we've just talked about, teachers should not change the assignments. In some assignments, R002, 3 and 4, the scenario cannot be changed because it is intrinsically linked to the tasks. OK. What else is it important for me to know as a teacher? Make sure you look at the marking criteria. We've now linked these to the tasks to make it clearer when you do your marking. Other helpful things are sample portfolios, which have a commentary on what the learners did and why particular marks were awarded. There are also frequent webinars where teachers can ask questions. So it's important that I get a feel for all this before my learners actually start on the assignments? Yes, because it will tell you how much depth learners will need to go into and you can ensure that you've covered the specification to the required depth and breadth before learners start on the OCR set assignment. You mustn't teach just to the assignment. Can I give learners templates? No. Let me explain um, why by giving you an example. In units R005, 6 and 7, learners are assessed on the structure of their specification. If you provide a template for them to use, then they cannot be given any credit for the structure because you've provided it. Giving learners a template here is over-direction. In providing the template, you are going to make decisions about what headings, etc., to use rather than the learners. OK. So we're expecting learners to independently make these decisions and we expect each learner to approach this in a slightly different way? We talked about the importance of knowing what learners are going to be doing before you start your teaching. 
What should I make sure the learners have whilst they're completing their assignment? Make sure that each learner has a copy of the set assignment, which includes the marking criteria. And also um, provide the specification teaching content. And this will help them to understand what they need to produce and the learning they need to evidence. We've now highlighted what would be appropriate evidence to produce, and that should help you and your learners. Can I be clear about the conditions that learners should complete this um, assessed work in? Yes, learners must be supervised. As a teacher, you also need to be confident that any research or other evidence like photographs were done by the learner on their own. Teachers and learners have to sign a declaration before work is submitted. Okay. Once I've marked the assignment, what feedback can I give to my learners, particularly if I don't think they've demonstrated what they know? You need to make sure that you're not giving an advantage to any individual. So if I give you some examples, you could say, this is only a description, not an evaluation. OK. Could I remind a learner of something that we've actually covered in a lesson? Yes, but you can't tell them how to apply this to the set assignment evidence. So no step-by-step -step instructions on how to do the task? No, that would be giving far too much detail. Sometimes teachers need to write witness statements to support the evidence. Can you give us some advice on the best way to do this? Well, there's some things to remember. Witness statements should be different for each individual. Even if learners have done a group activity, you need to record what each individual learner did. Also, witness statements must describe what the learner did. They shouldn't just state that certain assessment criteria have been met. The description needs to be in sufficient detail to enable the moderator to agree with your assessment decision. When you're making that assessment decision and completing the unit recording sheet, make sure you reference the evidence in the witness statement. OK. Can we also talk about copying work? I know that learners should copy from anyone else's work, but what about when they find information from the internet? Well, that comes up quite a lot. Lots of learners, you will use websites to find information. But rather than putting it in their own words, they use the internet article word for word. It's usually very easy to spot. The language won't feel like the learner's own. Now, clearly cutting and pasting an extract written by someone else into your own document doesn't make it the learner's own work. And learners need to show that they understand the information. And so the best way to do that is to put it in their own words. We've given some examples of this in the document that supports this video. It means more than substituting a few words. For a Cambridge National in ICT, it's actually very rarely the case that they need to directly reference someone else's ideas. Okay, great. So we shouldn't be expecting lots of printouts from the internet being su submitted as evidence? No, it doesn't show that the learner understands anything um, that they've read. Okay. Finally, this might sound like an odd question, but learners must complete their work independently without any teacher assistance? Yes. But there are three units where some assistance is explicitly allowed within the assessment criteria. These are R002, Learning Outcome 4, and R007 and R011, Learning Outcome 1. In these cases, you must provide a statement of the level and nature of any assistance provided, and the assessment criteria show how this level of assistance limits the potential mark available. Okay. Can I give assistance to a learner who otherwise would have to stop and couldn't get any of the later marks? For example, in R003, where they might be able to search, sort and muddle, but they're struggling to create a usable spreadsheet in order to do that. Yes, in a small minority of cases, this might be appropriate. But if any assistance is given in this way, where it's not accommodated within the assessment criteria, no credit can be given for the work produced with this assistance. OK. How should I record that? Because obviously the learner can't be credited for the work I've done. You need to put a statement on the unit recording sheet. And you're right in that the candidate can't be given credit for a task that they did not complete independently. Clearly, this is so that it's fair to all the other learners taking the qualification. Teachers need to assess the evidence. What do I need to think about in order to do that well? Remember that your moderator will check your assessment decisions based on the mark you award and the justification you give. Here is a unit recording sheet that's been completed really well. 
Each piece of evidence has a clear reference. If you're sending electronic files, then this should be the file name and location. The comments explain why the evidence meets the grading criteria. Key terms have been highlighted, which is sometimes helpful, but not a requirement. The highlighted terms clearly indicate to the moderator that the centre feels that the marks sit in this band. Supporting this are comments to explain why the work meets these requirements. Finally, evidence needs to be submitted for every assessment decision. We've given some additional guidance about the types of evidence we expect for every decision in the assignments. OK, so this URS tells the moderator where to find the evidence, as well as comments about the quality of the work. Yes. By putting comments on the unit recording sheet, that should mean that you don't need to do lots of annotation on the evidence itself. We really want this process to be as quick as possible for everyone. OK. And if I'm not sure about exactly what an individual term mentioned in the marking criteria means? Look in the marking criteria glossary of terms, which is at the back of the specification. It's Appendix D. For example, it defines thorough as extremely attentive to accuracy and detail, which is very helpful. So all the markings being completed, what else needs to happen before the work submitted to OCR? We expect that every learner has a complete portfolio of evidence that's been completed, handed in and assessed before the mark submission deadline. This work should then be stored securely, whether it's on paper, as electronic files or a mixture of the two. When the moderator requests the sample, then it should be straightforward for the centre to locate these portfolios. Work that's not completed and marked by the mark submission deadline should never be entered for moderation. It would raise questions about a, a centre's internal quality assurance procedures. This might sound obvious things to check, but sometimes they still go wrong. So for each learner, make sure that all the evidence is there. If you're sending in paper evidence, the best thing to do is treasury tag them together. OK, but I imagine for ICT, a lot of the evidence might be better if it's submitted electronically. Yes, as the evidence has naturally been generated in this way, it's often the best way to submit. There's a couple of things to mention here. Make sure that the file type is one that moderators can view. We provide a full list in Appendix C of the specification. Make sure that the files open and present as the learner intended. Common things that get missed are broken hyperlinks or embedded sound and vision files that don't run. So it's best to make sure that they will open on a standalone PC. With either electronic or paper-based evidence, if you're submitting screenshots, make sure they're big enough to be able to read them. We'd suggest that you instruct candidates not to use more than two per page. Every unit submitted needs a completed URS at the front. Yes. We talked about how these should be completed. You can use an interactive form for each unit recording sheet from the website and make sure that you've checked the totalling of the marks as well. OK. The learners obviously completed lots of other work. Do I need to send this in as well? No, please don't. <laughs> we just want to see the evidence produced for the assessment tasks. Sending any other work will cost you extra money in postage and it takes our moderators longer to review. OK. And the deadline dates for submitting marks, they're the same every year, aren't they? Yes. For postal moderation and repository, it's the 10th of January for the January series, the 15th of May for the summer series and the 5th of November for the November series. For visiting moderation, it's the 10th of December for the January series and the 31st of March for the summer series. Do watch out, these are earlier than for postal and repository deadlines. OK, thank you very much. If you want to know more about OCR's moderation process, the full instructions are on our website, or you could join one of our administration webinars. Finally, if when I mark the work, I suspect malpractice, what should I do? This will depend where you are in the process. If you find this before the candidate has signed the authentication sheet, you should follow your own internal centre procedures. You should reduce the mark awarded for the relevant marking criteria. The action taken and the reasons why the mark was reduced should be explained on the unit recording sheet. 
the mark should then be submitted to OCR as normal. If the candidate has already signed the authentication sheet, then the head of centre must follow the procedures which are set down in section 2.5 of the JCQ instructions for the conduct of coursework, which can be found on the JCQ website. Okay. What will happen if an OCR moderator identifies possible malpractice when they look at the work? If the centre hasn't identified the malpractice, then our risk and compliance team will follow OCR's malpractice procedure. The most common reasons for cases being reported are, firstly, over-direction by a teacher, secondly, plagiarism or copying and collusion, and thirdly, not using an OCR set assignment. Some cases may involve the malpractice committee at OCR. The role and responsibility of this committee can be found in Section 8 of the JCQ instructions. Anne, thank you for explaining about how to do effective assessment. If I have any other questions about moderation or the qualification, where can I go for other support? Well, OCR runs frequent webinars where you can ask questions about moderation. You book these through our CPD hub. There are also sample portfolios and commentaries on the website that you can refer to. There are also separate webinars which focus on administration for the Cambridge Nationals, which again can be booked through the CPD hub. Thank you very much. <laughs>